Ellie and I recently went on a hike with some family members we don't often see. As we walked, I pointed out some birds to one of my niece's children. Our niece, amused by this, noted that bird watching is really for old people. Hmm. I can't really argue with her observation, but bird watching is having a moment. With a TV show produced by National Geographic and a citizen science program run by the New York Times. As for the old people thing, it is true that bird watching does not require hiking or paddling to a remote location. In fact, many of the best places for bird watching in the Adirondacks are easily reached by car. The bike trail in Tupper Lake, Massaweepi, the Whitney Wilderness Headquarters area, or, maybe best of all, the Crown Point State Historic Site on Lake Champlain. The Adirondacks lie at an ecological crossroads, at the southern limit for some northern species, and as far north as some southern species will venture. This makes for an intriguing mix. Throw in the additional 100 species that have been recorded during migration, and there's always something interesting flitting about. Some of those migrating birds are known through the work of a dedicated group of volunteers who band birds each spring at Crown Point. Going back to 1976, they have banded 14,000 birds from 97 different species. This work, along with the work of others who survey bird populations, is critical for understanding if bird nesting patterns are shifting. Birds can react quickly to changing conditions. This makes them the canaries in the coal mine of our climate. One of the best things about bird watching is that you can do it wherever you are. And the more you know, the more you'll notice. For example, we just spent a couple of weeks visiting family near Hillsborough, Oregon. Sitting outside their home, we watched a nondescript bird hopping around the patio. It looked to be a fledgling, but I was having trouble figuring out the species. Then a couple of dark-eyed juncos appeared and a puzzling picture emerged. The fledgling was half again larger than the juncos and looked nothing like them. But it immediately approached one of the juncos, and its behavior could only be described as the baby bird equivalent of a toddler screaming for cookies in the grocery store. Ah, the fledgling was a brown-headed cowbird that had adopted the juncos as parents. Cowbirds are nest parasites, The females lay their eggs in the nests of other species and abandon them. Baby cowbirds hatch quickly and grow fast, so they get fed, and the bewildered mother bird ends up raising the cowbird. A second thing I noticed in Oregon illustrates why invasive species cause so much trouble. The property where we were staying is marked by a fence line that has been engulfed by a thicket of blackberries. These blackberries are not like the ones we have here. The bushes grow in a dense tangle higher than you can reach, and the canes were laden with berries to an extent that's hard to convey. What struck me was the lack of birds taking advantage of this bounty. Of the 20 or so bird species that I spotted in the vicinity, only the robins appeared to be eating the berries. These blackberries were introduced from Asia, and they have spread throughout western Oregon. Heck, even the bugs leave them alone. We picked and packed and made blackberry jam and frozen berries, and these berries come with no bugs. This is how invasive species disrupt ecosystems. They grow thick, they spread fast, and nothing eats them. Well, we do, 
but not fast enough. I've got nothing against robins or blackberries, but introduced species tend to form monocultures that crowd out the niche-specific species that inhabit native ecosystems. With reduced biodiversity, we often get unexpected consequences, like the explosion in tick populations that now plague the Northeast, or the role played by highly flammable non-native grasses in the recent fires in Hawaii. You know what they say, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs>